you so much for your time today. I really look forward to your insights and sharing those with those that have joined us for the call, and I'll let you take it away. Gail, thank you so much, and good afternoon, everyone. Hello, Adrian, Amy, Ann, Chris, Kristen, Colleen, Dane, Debbie, Don, Erica, Eileen, Jennifer, Jim, Julia, Catherine, Kelly, and let's see who else, Megan, Maureen, Lauren, it's so nice to meet you. Uh, today, I have Megan Wall, who will be my co-pilot, and as we walk through this conversation, she's going to post uh, different links in the chat that will really complement everything that I'm about to say. Tough conversations as good business can really be encapsulated in this one thought. Black people don't want a hand out, they want a hand up. Let me just say, everyone that looks like me does not think for me or speak for me, but as a result of almost 40 virtual presentations that I've done over the last few months, this is a reoccurring conversation that continues to come up. So there are seven specific recommendations that I generally teach, but for purposes of this conversation, I'm only gonna share three with you. And the first thing to think about is, does your organization truly have a commitment from your CEO? And if your CEO has made that commitment to really say, we wanna be on the right side of history, then you're, what your CEO is really saying, this is not just a statement that's posted on the website, but this is the standard operating procedure that we believe that racial equity and inclusion is good business. Let me give you an example of what this looks like real time. Tammy is a friend of mine. We've known each other for 20 plus years. She's the director of meetings and events for the U.S. chairman of PwC. And I sent her a note and I said, Tammy, I'm just curious, what is your chairman and CEO saying uh, as the result of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and certainly George Floyd being murdered? And she said, you won't believe the article that he wrote in LinkedIn. And Megan will, will put the link to that article, but Tim starts the article by saying that I am heart broken at the deaths and the murders of those that I just mentioned. This is the chairman of PwC, but he says, we're not gonna stop there. As an organization, we are going to specifically look at our US operations and begin to make a commitment like we never have before. PwC has gone as far under Tim's leadership. He's created the CEO Action Council that has over 1,400 CEOs that have signed up representing 85 different industries and representing almost 13 million employees who now have a window into what can we do. And Megan will post that link for you to see. But that is a real commitment. The CEO of Salesforce has made a commitment that they will double black representation of employees in leadership by 2023. And Salesforce will spend $100 million with minority owned businesses and increase that by 25% year over, over year. That's, that's a real commitment. But what's even more interesting when we talk about CEO commitment, I got a call from a good friend of mine, Linux, who is a third generation owner of a real estate company in Seattle, Washington. And he said, Simon, our foundation is going to fund two black American teachers to move to Seattle. We are going to pay for them to earn their teacher certificate so that they can teach in the urban area of Seattle. Because we believe if we start there, we can impact hundreds of lives. That's a real commitment. So it's not just enough to say we want diverse talent on our stages. And diversity and inclusion looks so big and it's awesome. It's flavor of the month. But the question is, is this a statement or is this a standard? The second recommendation I invite us to consider is to always remain curious. 
I had a great, the great honor last week to have a fireside virtual chat, chat with Dr. Francesca Gino. Dr. Gino is professor of business administration at Harvard University, uh, teaches PhD courses, and she presented around this whole thought around strategic agility, and I had a chance to just talk to her for 20 minutes, asking her questions as they were coming in the chat. I said, Dr. Gino, what is your research saying about organizations that you are looking at right now? And she said, individuals, no matter where they are in the organization, they don't have to be a leader with a title. They can be an individual contributor. As we move into 2021 and beyond, she says, everyone has to remain curious. The ability to say, I don't know what I don't know, but I'm totally open for discovering how I can contribute to this important conversation. Because see, when we are curious, we then challenge ourselves in having a tough conversation to say, am I under pressure or is this a practice in the organization on how we hire talent, diverse talent? So here's a question for you. When you hear the name Shaquita, do you think Shaquita's ethnicity is black, Hispanic, Asian, white, Shaquita? What if I told you that Shaquita sent out her resume to different companies throughout Chicago and never ever received one call? And of course, everything is electronic now. And so could it be that the moment people saw her name, they really weren't interested in Shaquita? But what's interesting is what if I told you that Shaquita was a graduate, both undergrad and master's degree from Northwestern University. And what if I told you that Shaquita had to legally change her name to Kendall, and the moment she changed her name to Kendall and sent out her resume, not only did she get offers, she had to pick up the litter and joined a Fortune 500 company, all because she changed her name. So you're probably curious, how do I know this? Well, Shaquita is my cousin. And over the last few months, the cousins have gotten together on Zoom just to catch up. And Shaquita shared this story with us that she had to change her name to Kendall in order to get a job. So when I say, is, are you under pressure? Or is there practice to really look at how are we recruiting talent into the organization? And, and here's the thing, let me be honest with you. I am telling black people, now is not the time to try to leverage white guilt. Let, let's just have a frank conversation. You have to be good. And if you're good, it's a bonus that you're black. But you should not try to say, help me get a job and give me a hand out when you're not good. If anything, you want a hand up. So how curious are you in this whole conversation? So you're probably saying, Simon, I'm very curious. So then that leads me to the third suggestion and recommendation. Are you ready to be a champion? Are you ready to be an ally? Are you ready to be a sponsor? Megan's gonna post some links to some great articles and tools that we believe can help you uh, along this journey. But I wanna share with you just a few examples of what allyship, sponsorship, being a champion really, really looks like. So over the last 30 years, I've worked for six different companies, 10 different jobs. My last job was sales director, a new business development director for the Disney Institute. Now what's interesting about that journey at Disney, it took me two years to get hired at Disney, 10 interviews in a 10 page psychological analysis from Gallup organization. And if the truth be told, I was about to quit. I'm like, whatever, you know, <laughs> you know, I wasn't really buying into, oh, boys and girls, this is Mickey Mouse. I was like, whatever, right? So eventually I get hired. And about day 80, I'm going to quit Disney because I am lost as a goose in a blizzard. Can't get anything done. I left an organization of 100 employees now working in an organization of 64,000 people working within 47 square miles. 
day 80, I just happened to get a call from Janice, who was the HR recruiter that recruited me over two years. And she said, I was thinking about you just checking in. I said, Janice, when I hit the 90 day mark, I am, I am gone. I can't get anything done. And she said, wait a minute, everything you need to get done is not in the Disney employee handbook. It's all about relationships. I said, Janice, I have no relationships. She said, I'm going to connect you with Jim and Brad. Brad, U.S. Naval, grad, Harvard MBA, Jim, Purdue Boilermaker. And these two guys begin to teach me the unwritten rules of engagement of how things are done at the Mouse House. And what would have only been 90 days turned out to be seven years. But Jim and Brad were not my only sponsors and allies. There was an opportunity to become a leader within the organization. And Larry saw something in me some 20 plus years ago that I did not see in myself. And Larry gave me a hand up. He opened a door, he made a call, he wore my brand t-shirt in boardrooms, in different meetings that I did not have access to. And he leveraged his relationship to say, I wanna give him a shot, and he gave me a shot. And I've never forgotten that because as a result of Larry giving me a shot, I was able to buy my first home, send my kids to private school, I have two, and now they're both in college. All because the real conversation is economic equity. That's the conversation. According to Dr. David Williams, who is a sociologist at Harvard. In his latest research, he's basically saying that whites in America have 10 times more the wealth than blacks do. So this whole conversation of economic equity, that's where the conversation needs to go. Because when individuals have a hand up, they can change a generation. A few years ago, a friend of mine, Merrill, said, if you're ever in Santa Barbara, I want you to come by my club. I want to introduce you to my friend, Linda. Now, you have to understand, I was born in the ghetto of Buffalo, New York, uh, lived in Atlanta. So when you say club, I'm like, okay, like, is this a dancing club? Like club, what do you mean? Until I got to her club in Montecito, California, and I walked to the desk and I gave my name. I said, I'm here to see Meryl. And, and they called for Meryl. And I said, Meryl, this is amazing. And she said, you see that young man over there? And this young man, he was walking around. That's the grandson of the guy who created the Egg McMuffin. I said, oh, it's that kind of party. So she said, I want you to meet a friend of mine, Linda. So we're waiting for Linda. And I said, Meryl, how much does it cost to be a member of this club? And she said, well, the initiation fee is about $250,000 annually. And I was like, okay, so this is a different conversation. So eventually her friend Linda shows up and Linda begins to tell me about a company that her and her husband Bruce started 20 plus years ago when YouTube was launched. And she said, our company, lynda.com, L-Y-N-D-A.com is all about teaching skills in a micro way. So she's telling me, she says, listen, get in your car, follow me, I'm gonna take you over to my company. We go over to her company and all I remember, there were 522 year old young people running around. I was like, I don't know what they are doing here, but I need to be involved in this. She walks me into her director of content. She said, this is Simon, he's my new friend. I want his content on our platform. And there was about a dozen people in the meeting and then she walks out. So the director of content pulled me on the side. She said, we don't know who you are. And do you realize it takes about six months for people to be on our platform? But if Linda says she wants you on the platform, you're on the platform, so you're in. So I was like, okay. And I'm like a deer staring at headlights because I don't know what I just said yes to or what I signed up to. But what I knew intuitively in my gut, I was supposed to be there. Fast forwarding, lynda.com eventually was acquired by LinkedIn. LinkedIn was acquired by Microsoft. And as a result of me saying yes to something that I did not have access to, 
our content has been viewed by people in 100 countries. When I talk about a hand up, Meryl gave me a hand up that day at her prestigious country club, and she introduced me to a relationship that she guarded as sacred. And that relationship opened another door. And a year after I said yes to going on the platform, Linda and Bruce sold the company. My whole point is tough conversations is good business because when individuals are given a hand up, they realize that I must now reach back and pull somebody else forward. So if you're ready to be a champion, if you're ready to be a sponsor, if you're ready to be an ally, who can you help? Who do you work with or know that doesn't have access to a relationship? They're not on a committee. They're not a part of a, a group. They're not in the clique or the club. They don't have the fortune ability to talk to people over the weekend before business starts again on Monday. Relationships are the currency of the future. So if we really understand that tough conversations is good business, what's the global conversation around this? And the global conversation right now is everyone in corporations and businesses are looking at moving from shareholder to stakeholder. And a part of that movement to stakeholder is how do we make a difference in not just the shareholders, but in the stakeholders, in the company, in the community, in the people that work with us who have been disenfranchised and marginalized for 400 years. How do we begin to change the conversation? So if you're ready to be a champion, I want you to begin to say, what can I do right now? Who can I sponsor? Who can I help? What if I went to them and say, I don't know what I don't know, but how can I help you? I am here today, ladies and gentlemen, because Gail at GDA in 2012 gave me a hand up. I was a nobody. I had just left Disney. I was just starting out. And Gail said, I'm going to give you a shot and a chance. Now, if I wasn't good, Gail would not book me again. Let's just be frank, because that's not smart business. <laughs> but what I realize, if you're ready to really make that commitment, be curious and be a champion, it simply starts with, do I want to be successful? Or do I want to be significant? Because success is about me. Significance is about we. And that is good business. With that, Gail, how about we take some questions? I love that. Does anyone want to use the raise your hand feature and uh, interact with Simon or put something in the chat? Whatever you all prefer. Don't be shocked. We have this access here. I know there was a question I was sitting here thinking when I was listening to you, Simon. Um, I get the concept. I'm a small business owner, but what's small or medium sized? What are some practical things? Like, you know, obviously being really aware in your hiring practices. Then I was thinking like mentorship. I'm just wondering if you have some really good examples that people could say, you know what, in 2021, I'm going to do X. Yeah. What some small businesses are doing right now is they sit down uh, with their accountant and they say, let's look at our expenses. Where are we spending money? And is there any opportunity yet for us to outsource or find a, a black or brown supplier? that we can do business with, who can provide uh, as good a service that we're currently receiving or even better, all right? Uh, another example is, which I think is so interesting, is many chambers of commerce are recognizing that there are small businesses that are established, but there's new businesses of black and brown people that are just starting, and they may be in the same space, or they may not necessarily compete, but they need to level up. Uh, many of the majority of businesses who've been there done that, they understand that success leaves clues. What would it be like to become a buddy for these budding 
uh, companies and businesses to say, here are the mistakes to avoid, here's what you need to learn, let me cut down your learning curve so that you can accelerate quicker and faster. I think a third way is not just writing a check to organizations that are focused on uh, racial injustice, that's very important to continue to do that. But what some small businesses are saying, hey, what if we begin to use our relationships to accelerate the conversation a little bit quicker and change policies, find more ways to really rid out this whole systemic racism. That's what you can do right now, and that's what many are doing. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question? We've got some time. I'm looking, I'm not trying to put him on the spot. I'm just seeing if any hands are going up. I'm not on that second screen, so. Oh, good, Adrian. Unmute yourself and talk, my friend. Adrian is, I've known her for a long time. She's a YPO member, and now I think a YPO gold member. Is that right, Adrian? That's right. Nice to see you again, Gail. And hi, Simon. Thank you for the fantastic presentation. So my question has to do with in a, in a large organization where there is a lot of uh, lip service and optics being put out there, but not real action that's occurring. It's like the can keeps getting kicked down the road because, you know, there's so many things. We've got COVID this and we've got this over here and it's just not a priority. And how can we as leaders address this in a way that comes across, you know, genuinely as this is an important topic and it's not just because I'm a minority, it's because this is good business. Without sounding confrontational, accusatory, uh, like I got a chip on my shoulder, you know, all of those things, what strategies would you suggest? First of all, Adrian, I want to acknowledge and honor your question, your honesty, because it takes a lot of uh, chutzpah to ask that question, okay? So the first thing, what can you do is to look at your current team. And is there anyone on your team who uh, perhaps uh, might be marginalized that you can use your voice to speak up, speak out and say, hey, I noticed that and, and we have to address that. That's just something that's perhaps around you, another department, another division. Um, the second strategy is who are the champions at an executive level who get it? And how do you begin to partner with them by saying, how can I support your efforts as we try to impact the rest of the organization? Uh, what happens in some corporations, there's an executive champion who will say, you know what, uh, I'm going to take on uh, diversity and inclusion. I'm gonna be the executive sponsor. And it's connecting with that executive sponsor to say, how do we continue to drive this conversation and position in such a way, Adrian, where you're gonna make them look good. So in some of the article links that uh, Megan put in there, you will see some specific examples of what's really working. Hey, Megan, let's also upload what Kroger is doing. Um, what Kroger is doing, Adrian, literally is the playbook on here's how you do it. The third thing to consider, the next time you're planning, let's say a virtual meeting and you have to use third party vendors or outside companies, what would it be like to ask whoever you're working with to source black and brown businesses? Just ask the question. They may have not thought of it, but the more and more you begin to tee it up, they're like, whoa, we should be thinking of this. And you just gave someone a hand up. Thank you. I mean, there, there is a question on here from Chris, and I, I'm going to read it in, out of the chat. When I talk with people about systemic racism and unconscious bias, I often feel two forces competing. The first is an urgency to educate them about how unconscious bias impacts decisions and ultimately neg negatively impacts marginalized communities. The other is an understanding that approach matters and that my ability to change a person's beliefs and actions 
depends in part on my skill to broach these difficult topics in a way that's compassionate, devoid of judgment or ridicule. What advice do you have for me and for others who are looking for advice on how to approach these conversations? Yeah. So um, one of the, uh, and, and Megan, I'm gonna have you post this, uh, white allyship, uh, the link as it talks about once you're woke, how do you stay woke and enter into these conversations, all right? So it really starts with this whole approach of, listen, I need to talk to you and I'm gonna let you know at the very beginning, I don't know what I don't know. But if you are open, like I am open, I wanna see if we can build a bridge together. We may not agree, but we will have some understanding that both of us can grow from. Are you open to having this dialogue. And what you're doing, Chris, in positioning it that way is to come off as if I'm not a know-it-all, I don't have all the answers. Yes, I've watched, you know, Just Mercy. Yes, I've seen Black Panther. You don't have to say that. Yes, I've seen 13th in Netflix. I'm woke. You don't have to say that because that comes off a little bit patronizing, but to say, I'm just open to a dialogue. Are you open? And that allows them to say, you know what? I want to go there. And then once you have that buy-in that they're open, then say, so I have some questions. Are, is it okay if I start? And you start with your first question uh, because it's in the quest question that we discover, learn, and grow. That's a, that's a very good answer. Thank you. Um, I definitely want to be mindful of everyone's time. I know we publicize this as a 2 to 2.30 event. Uh, as we've done sometimes previously, Simon has agreed to stay on to just give us a little insight into what he's seeing with virtual events. So for those of you that, that have other commitments and you need to go, Thank you so much for being here. If you would like to talk about bringing Simon into your organization, please reach out to your GDA agent. And we will get everybody uh, all the links and a follow-up email, as well as a copy of the recording. And hopefully we can take this and, and make an impact. For those of you that have time, stay on. Simon's just going to tell us a little bit about what he's seeing in the event space. Not only virtually, but he actually did a live event in Orlando I want you to hear about. So for those that leave, bye. And for those of you who are staying, um, let's go, Simon. Let's see. What are you seeing virtually that's really working? I think uh, the ability to have a co-pilot. So I've got Megan as a co-pilot to the interaction. People have Zoom fatigue. So the ability to share stories. But the other thing, and this just happened on Saturday. I was participating in a webinar with about 100 of my colleagues from all over the world. And uh, a guy named Matt Weinstein, uh, who always goes to colleges and universities uh, for their initial uh, freshman icebreaker, all of a sudden said, we're going to do icebreaker via Zoom. So his first activity was, uh, you probably have seen the scavenger hunt. Go and find one thing in your house that you think no one else has. So I went and I grabbed a sculpture uh, that had been created um, by uh, an artist named Thomas Blackshear. And so you've got 100 people showing on Zoom what they have, but then they put everybody into small, into the small meeting part of Zoom. So now you're in a Zoom meeting room with four and you start to tell others what this means to you. But it's a twofold benefit. There's also networking because you're meeting people for the first time. They would leave you in the meeting for about three to four minutes, so each person has a minute, then they pull you back to the main room. The next exercise he did, which was so like crazy, he said, think of your first job. And once you think of your first job, you're gonna be put into a small room and tell everyone about that first job. So once again, now you're in a room, three to four new people, and you're telling uh, about this job. But he added a little twist. He said, uh, and this is probably borrowing a line from improv comedy. You then had to switch roles with someone based on their first job. 
and then add to it. And then everyone, once you came back into the main room, you had to guess who was the real person that they were talking about. Now, he didn't do that for all 100. He hand-selected a few. It was total great because when you have Zoom fatigue, it's a nice way to split things up. Another thing that I'm seeing that's working really well is uh, virtual fireside chats where you interview an authority uh, that's in a space and you get to ask them questions in the moment. And, and because of the realness of that experience, people are like, what? It's happening real time. Uh, the other thing that we're seeing is uh, the ability after the Zoom experience to receive what I would call these digital snackables that are just about a minute from the thought leader or speaker that begins to reinforce what they just shared. And that snackable, the companies will push that out to everyone that participated in the Zoom experience. I love that term, a digital snackable. I, I love that. Uh, so I, I follow you on social media and I just marveled at the links you went to to recently get to an event in Europe. Would you mind sharing what was behind that? Oh my goodness. So back in uh, January, of course, no one really saw COVID uh, coming. We received a call from a client saying, hey, we are hosting 120 of our top uh, business owners from Italy, we're going to host them in Switzerland. Would you come? So in January, uh, right after the new year, we said, absolutely, yes, we'll be there. Their event is September 26. Well, all of a sudden COVID hits and we're talking to them in August and they're like, well, Switzerland has one of the lowest COVID-19 rates. Are you still coming? We're like, yes, we're coming. And because when I did some work for Ritz Carlton, they reminded me the answer is yes. Now, what's the question? So we said, how do we do this? Well, in going to Europe that had been closed, the only way to get to Europe was to fly to London and quarantine for 14 days. So uh, the office booked me to fly to London, quarantine for 14 days, found a, a decent rate at a hotel. And then the client said, get, can you get to Milan? We'll have a private car pick you up in Milan and drive you to Switzerland. So sure enough, after the 14th day, I'm standing at British Airways and that I had to prove that I had quarantine for 14 days. So I showed my hotel bill, I had my visa, I showed uh, the letter from the client that was in Italian. Here's what I'm going. This is not leisure. This is not, this is certainly for business. So flew to Milan, got picked up. They drove me into Switzerland. I, we got stopped as we were going from Italy to Switzerland to say, do you have $10,000? Are you carrying money on you? <laughs> I said, no. And I showed them the letter in Italian and they're like, okay, you can go. So sure enough, um, went to the event. The client had all of their attendees in uh, other seats. They wore their mask. I, I didn't have a mask on during my presentation. They were fine with that because I was far enough away. Had translators uh, who translated in Italian for me. It was a wonderful experience. They were like, oh my God, we are so happy that you came because everybody else said they were not traveling uh, during COVID-19. Now, I practiced every, all the protocols, um, hand sanitizer, all those things. Uh, and it totally worked out. And I was there to deliver a full day presentation, did that, flew back and uh, knock on wood, uh, no, no health challenges at all. Well, that level of commitment is exactly why we're still working together. That's amazing. I love that story. Um, I, I know you also recently did an in-person event in Orlando that I think had 500 people. And I'm sure people were super curious to hear how that went. Yeah, so I, I live here in Orlando, Florida, just a stone's throw away from Disney World. And Klein booked me to come to an event at Gaylord uh, Palm in Kissimmee, or some say Kissimmee, and uh, went, did the event, 500 people, everybody uh, had to sit at tables with their intact group, okay? The tables were six feet apart, okay? Um, everybody had to wear masks. Uh, per uh, the Kissimmee City regulations, because of where the hotel is. Um, I'm on stage, so I was fine. Uh, but before I could uh, come from backstage, I had to have my mask on backstage. So I had my mask on backstage. The entire crew had their mask on backstage. They had hand sanitizer stations throughout 
the meeting room itself and outside the meeting room. When they went on break, everything was covered um, in plastic containers. Uh, and then if there was ice cream um, that was packaged, but it was served by the staff, so they didn't want people reaching in. All of the staff of the Gaylord, they had gloves on uh, during that time. And so net net, you felt safe. Uh, you felt very safe uh, during that event. Perfect, excellent. Well, does anyone else have any questions? I'll look over here in the chat. I think we're good. Hi, Chris. Hi, and hi Kelly. Nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah, we, we had a lot of YPO people. <laughs> Kelly and Twyla and Adrian. Awesome. Well, Simon, I, I'm still back on just the importance of the content. And thank you so much for, for helping us navigate through that. And, you're a great resource on that topic, as well as many others, including customer service and creativity and all of the things you've been talking about for years. But now's the time for you to share that perspective. It's so great. Awesome. Um, just a friendly reminder to everyone, if you would like to brainstorm on what we can do with Simon for your organization or your association, give us a call and let us know. If you enjoy these GDA Live events, we'll be back December 7th with Mike Rayburn. And uh, it's guaranteed to be a lot of fun. He's going to play the guitar and throw some comedy in there to illustrate his message. So that'll be a fun thing to do as we ramp up to the holiday season. And we'll look forward to seeing you then. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you.